Vaccine passports are to be introduced in Scotland from next month following a vote in Holyrood by MSPs. Proof of double vaccination will be needed before entry is allowed into nightclubs and other similar venues. The scheme will also affect all outdoor events with large crowds. This means things like football matches and fo uh, music festivals are set to become restricted for unvaccinated fans. Yes, well, for more on this, we're joined now by Rebecca Butler, who is a retired nurse turned barrister and trained vaccinator as well, which I think is a cracking uh, turn of phrase. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, is this discriminatory against people who aren't going to get the jab? Uh, no, it isn't. I, I mean, I believe that this is in a response to um, two metrics that uh, Scotland, like the rest of the world, measures, namely the case positivity rate and the hospitalisation rate. So Scotland has a marginally higher vaccination uh, compliance than the UK as a whole. It's about 2% higher, but their case positivity rate has rocked up ever since the schools went back about three weeks ago. So they are three weeks ahead of us. And um, anybody who thinks the UK as a whole won't be here in three or four weeks' time uh, isn't watching the headlines. This is coming to all of us very, very soon. And no, I don't think it's discriminatory. Discrimination is about not giving people access to the same uh, facilities, but everybody is given free access to this vaccine. OK, all right. Uh, and, and what about people who simply can't get it, right? So let's say they've got, I don't know, an underlying health condition, or I believe, anyway, the advice still is if you've had a really terrible reaction to the first jab, you, you, you should think seriously anyway about, about getting the second one. So for those people, their lives are being impacted, aren't they? No, because there are no medical conditions that would preclude you from having the vaccine. The only issue where medical conditions come into play is those people who have immunosuppressant therapy. Their immune system doesn't respond appropriately to the vaccine, and they are the people who are most at risk. If you have an allerge allergenic response, to pretty much anything and specifically to AstraZeneca, you simply go into hospital to have the vaccine and you would probably be offered the Pfizer anyway. So there are no medical conditions that preclude vaccination, I'm afraid. So that is a duff argument. It is one that is deployed by people who are anti-vax, um, but it doesn't exist as a thing in medicine. Uh, are you comfortable uh, with you know, vaccine passports almost sort of from an ethical perspective because uh, it is unprecedented uh, uh, in this country to sort of have to show, uh, you know, that you've had a medical intervention in order to, you know, access, uh, not necessarily services, but just to enjoy your life and go about your daily life. That's unprecedented. Are you comfortable with that? Uh, well, no, of course not. Um, we're, we're suffering a global pandemic, so of course I'm not comfortable. Um, you know, the day that people like me who've been out of health for a very long time and, you know, went in and still am a barrister, the day people like me are volunteering to go back and help the country out is a pretty bad day for all of us. So now I'm deeply uncomfortable about it, but I'm deeply uncomfortable that we are living through this pandemic. When you ask me about COVID passports, to be honest, it's going to be a choice. Are we going to have passports or are we going to have a lockdown? And I just hope that we don't delay too much that we end up with both. If you look across the channel at Germany and France, for example, they have managed to suppress their case numbers and have improved their vaccine compliance by imposing vaccine passports. It hasn't been a major incursion on people's liberties. On the medical information point, it's only certification of a vaccine. It is hardly a major disclosure of your health information. It's not your health records. It is simply a record of your vaccination certificate. That's all it is. And if, if you really don't want to show that, then you don't go into a pub, you don't go into a nightclub. You know, and, and that, well, that's just how interest, it Why should it matter, happen. right? Why should it matter? If every single other person in that pub has had the jab and the jab works, if I haven't had the jab, why can't I go for a pint? Because who am I, who am I killing? So <laughs> this is not about death, uh, Patrick. Okay. This is more about you don't want to get COVID anyway because there is a lot of 
difference between recovering from COVID and dying from COVID and the spectrum of problems you can get between the two is highly significant. But your answer really lies in the question because only 68% of people have had their vaccines. And so there are still an outstanding 32%. Uh, and, you know, you don't want to be exposed to any greater risk from this disease yeah. by being in contact with people who haven't had the vaccine. I, I understand that. Vaccine- I understand that. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Just we're a bit pressed for time. That's all. I just want to get your, your take on this. Why, why can't it work the other way around? Right. If I decide that I want to go to a music festival or I want to go to a sporting event and I realise that at that uh, music festival, there's 80,000 people and we're all in a field somewhere. Right. Why can't people make the choice for themselves about whether or not they want to take that risk. So why, why do we have to have the vaccine passports is, 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 is my issue. Why can't people just weigh it up and go, well, I've decided now, because I think most people don't really care anymore. Well, 32% of people on your sample of 80,000, for example, you know that 32%, so just under a third of people, haven't been vaccinated. And that is a risk because you know that the efficacy of the vaccine is 68%. So those who are vaccinated are safer and they are less likely to transmit it to you. There is transmission with Delta and I know vaccinated people hold the virus. But at the end of the day, in a pandemic, all we are doing is protecting the health service. And we currently have seven and a half thousand people in hospital with coronavirus, that is about seven hospitals. That is a huge burden on the NHS because every COVID patient blocks a cancer patient, blocks a, you know, a chest cancer patient, it blocks all sorts of patients mm. when you have COVID in hospitals. So the ultimate goal always is protection of the NHS. And until we have a hundred percent compliance with the vaccines. Mm. I'm afraid that this is going to be the incentive to get people vaccinated. It's worked in France remarkably. Yeah. A very, see, very vaccine-hesitant country. See, it's I, I, look, I've got to be honest with you. I look at it the other way. I don't think the ultimate goal is to protect the NHS. I think the ultimate goal is for the NHS to protect us, and, and I don't think it's doing that. You know, we've got pe- record numbers of people on waiting lists. GPs for face-to-face appointments are down from eighty percent to fifty-six percent, for example. People having to pay for their own routine operations and even pay for major operations. And and at the same time, the NHS is employing diversity chiefs and execs on 270 grand, which is 80 percent more than what the prime minister's on, apparently. I mean, hang on a minute. What's the NHS there for, you know? Well, you know, I agree entirely, but the NHS can't protect you at the moment because of the number of coronavirus. Well, they're not going back to work, though, are they either? You know, that's, the, that's part yeah, of the problem. Are. Well, they are at work, sorry. They're not in the surgeries, a lot of the GPs. There's a key distinction there. But you know, do you not think that the optics of that are pretty bad? Oh, you're pushing at an open door with everything you've just said about GPs <laughs> and health service managers. I've lived in the health service, and I know that the big problem at the moment for the health service is staffing. Given it takes 15 years to train your surgeon or your consultant physician or whatever specialist it is, and it takes four years to train a nurse, you're not going to see any benefit from that 36 billion for very many years. So yes, I agree with you, but we still have a problem that there are uh, one, one ITU patient with COVID is equivalent to 10 elective procedures. That is 10 patients who are waiting because of coronavirus. And then multiply that across the hospital. Hospitals are sequestered into green and red zones. We are living in a horribly dystopian environment in the health service. Mm. Hospitals are divided into two and they cannot operate at 90% bed occupancy if they are having to cope with this highly infectious disease. So while I agree with you that they exist to care for us, they cannot care for us without exposing us to coronavirus. And we don't want that either. Good stuff, thank you so much. Appreciate you coming on and uh, and having such a, 
a robust discussion. Yeah, the, I mean, like, on the issue of France, I mean, yes, they've introduced... I don't mm. even think you can go shopping in a two-year-old No, you've got to tap in you everywhere. You eagerly uh, have that. But there has been lots of unrest. You know, there's been a lot of civil unrest and protest mm. against it. So it, it's not as if, you know, just because it's working in France doesn't mean it's been received and welcomed mm. by, by everybody. I think that's the problem. And if we were to introduce vaccine passports here, which looks like that's mm. what's going to happen, there will be a, a lot of protests and it won't be coming from people mm. who are necessarily anti-vax. It will be people who don't want to live in a society where you have to, to, to prove you've had a medical intervention to enjoy your life. Yeah, yeah, that was Rebecca Butler, by the way. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, uh, yeah, I think there's a, there's a real blurring of the lines here between the idea of someone being anti-vax mm -hmm. and someone maybe being a bit sceptical or wary of taking a vaccine and being wary of vaccine passports. So I think those two things are, are completely separate. I think, you know, being anti-vax is, is one thing, but I think having you know, genuine personal concerns about, for whatever reason you may have, about whether or not you want to put something in your body or whether or not you think there's a civil liberties issue at play with, with uh, vaccine passports, that, that's different to being anti-vax, you know? Yeah, yeah.